talked about how I don't handle my email, and they couldn't even imagine not checking their email in a 24 hour period. That alone was blowing their mind. You mean you don't have to check your email and reply to message once a day? No, no I was saying not even once a week. I was going two to three weeks without actually processing my emails. Hey, this is Yarrow. Before I press play on today's episode of the EJ Podcast, I'd like to invite you to download the latest version of my Blog Profits Blueprint, a free report available in audio and written text that will take you through an A to Z guide on how to set up a blog designed to be your main online marketing channel. I'll teach you how to grow your email list, I'll teach you how to grow your brand, and most importantly, how to make sales of your products and services using the power of blogging. It's been downloaded over 150,000 times already and is the starting point for many of the most popular bloggers you know today. You can get it for free from blogprofitsblueprint.com. Hello, this is Yarrow and welcome to a solo edition of the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. Today I'm going to be telling you a story about how I originally switch to essentially an inbox zero strategy. Uh, My goal was to get email off my plate so I never had to deal with email. And you might be surprised to know that that was something that I switched to over 12 years ago as I record this episode. So you probably have been dealing with email most of your adult life, depending on how old you are anyway, on some level, whether it's personal email, a job email, or if you're an entrepreneur, which you probably are, uh, business email, people emailing you in relation to something about your business, not to mention all the spam and newsletters that we get. And it's pretty safe to say that there's nothing else in the online world that probably takes as much time as dealing with your inbox if it's you as the only person who actually has to deal with your inbox. I know that from my own experience because for a good six, seven years, I was the man in charge of my inbox, obviously personal email and business email. In particular, business email was something that I found took a big chunk of my day And I really did not like the fact that I would lose days to doing email and not actually moving forward with my business. I'd be reacting to things going on in my business, in my inbox. So I'd be possibly processing jobs, replying to potential jobs. I might be just dealing with, uh, you know, everyday questions coming through for things that don't really benefit the bottom line in my business. And I'd spend two or three hours doing that. And by the end of it, I'd feel pretty tired. And I wouldn't want to necessarily switch over and, you know, keep working to actually grow my business because my energy was depleted. And I didn't like that because I wanted to make sure my business was growing and moving forward each day and not just treading water. And I feel that email can be very much a treading water activity in your business. So for me, I had sort of two goals here. I knew I wanted to keep growing my business and I had to get email off my plate. But more importantly, I also wanted to live what I call the laptop lifestyle, which is essentially have a business that fuels my freedom so I can do what I want. And if email is taking all my time, then that is by far the biggest constraint to living a laptop lifestyle and having that freedom. Because if you have to do your email, then you don't really have the opportunity to do whatever else you want. You have to always be going back to your inbox. And I remember very clearly the day where I saw how big a problem email was in my life. So I I had built an online business and I had certainly enjoyed some success with a, a virtual lifestyle in the sense that I could travel with my business. I could run it anywhere online as long as I had access to the internet. Uh, bearing in mind this was prior to mobile phone internet connection. So I do want to kind of clarify why this was perhaps even more difficult than it would be today. Uh, I, I can tell you a story. I was actually um, traveling down to Sydney and I was running my uh, essay editing business called Better Edit. And this was way back in the early 2000s. And I was still the person in charge of essentially processing jobs, which meant forwarding emails from customers through to my contract editing team and then forwarding it back to customers, just keeping the communication flowing And because jobs, essay editing jobs and thesis editing jobs could be quite time sensitive, so there'd be very quick turnaround times required because the students had to hand in their paper, 
I had to make sure there wasn't too long a delay between getting that paper to the editor and then getting it back to the student. So because of that, I found myself in Sydney and constantly looking for internet cafes to just log in, check the email inbox, and process any jobs. And I usually did that every two to three hours because I didn't want to miss any jobs that came in under a rush condition. And ironically, there weren't really that many jobs. But because I had to look out for them, I ended up spending you know, half my day near internet cafes. So I couldn't really feel that sense of freedom, do whatever I want and not worry about my business. And that was when I went, you know, something's wrong here. I haven't really realized the kind of freedom that I've been aiming for. Yes, my business is virtual. Yes, it's something I can take with me. But I'm, if I'm going into internet cafes, or even if I feel this sense of pressure to keep checking my inbox because something might be important there that I need to deal with quickly, that's not freedom. That's a stress point. That's taking away uh, the, the sense of freedom that I'm looking for from my business. I want to be relaxed knowing that I'm making enough money to do what I like and my business is looking after itself without me. So there was that final piece of the puzzle that I hadn't quite cracked yet. I was smart enough to build a business that functioned without me in the sense that my editors were contractors and I wasn't the one doing the editing and my customers were coming primarily from online marketing so I didn't have to you know, do too much to keep that business growing once it reached a certain point because I was getting repeat customers. They were finding me through Google search. So I didn't have to do a lot to, you know, keep the new customers coming in, which left me with basically looking after the inbox as my main role. So I remember clearly when I came back from that trip to Sydney, how I said, this is something I have to uh, deal with. And I will be honest with you, I was concerned with hiring someone to handle email for me for two reasons. One, it's an aspect of letting go. There was a, a way I'd like to reply to emails. There was, you know, a type of customer service I wanted to provide. There was, you know, interactions in terms of negotiating prices sometimes. And I'd be worried that people, if I hired someone, they wouldn't be as good at doing that as, as I was, you know, dealing with the clients, dealing with the editors. I felt like there was a unique set of skills that I had that I used in this business. And I wasn't sure if I could replicate or find someone else to do that as well as I was. Plus, I was also concerned about costs. You know, you have to hire someone, you have to pay them. And I didn't know if the business could actually financially support uh, giving uh, some of the cash flow to a, a contractor to also handle email because that's not a revenue generating job in the sense that they were not processing contract work. They weren't doing editing, which generates the revenue. They were just maintaining kind of like an administration customer service role. And, you know, I'll be honest, I didn't really have the sense to see that this job is more than just administration. It's actually sales as well. And this person, you know, could be someone who actually brings in more revenue. I, I, it's, it's silly for me to even think this now because I knew I was often the one converting a sale via email convincing someone to you know buy from us so the person I hired to replace me in that email role is essentially a salesperson too so you know in hindsight now when I look back and I certainly know my business today if you look at email it's not just customer support or administration or even you know dealing with spam messages and newsletters coming into your inbox it's also doing sales there's uh, retaining customers so it's actually a really important part of your business so when you look to hire someone to take over this role, you really have to be careful and you know, take the, the hiring process seriously. So let me continue the story so I can tell you how I've reached the point where, as I record this, I haven't handled my own email for over a decade. In fact, it's getting to 12, 13 years now. Now, you probably have seen people over the years uh, sort of... Uh, you know, proudly state that they're no longer handling their email or you know on Facebook writing how shocked they are that it's taken them so long to hire a virtual assistant to take over their email and and what a time saver that was and I remember as I've seen people do this kind of in my own head going yeah it's obvious why doesn't everyone do this it's almost like there's something that holds us all back from this part of our business being outsourced. We seem to be okay with outsourcing tech, you know, hiring people to handle our websites, hiring people to deal with perhaps some of the more marketing focused uh, processes, like maybe doing social media for us or doing ad buying for us. Um, you know, maybe we're happy to hire a virtual assistant to organize uh, our trips, you know, do all those sort of administration roles. But we don't seem to quickly jump into this idea of here's the inbox, handle it for me. 
and walk away completely from email. And I did that so long ago now that to me it seems like Honestly, almost the smartest decision I ever made, especially in terms of a laptop lifestyle, that is by far the single most important aspect to outsource if you want true freedom. Because until you step away from your inbox, you're not free. I guarantee that. And I'm pretty sure you probably know that yourself. So what I want to do with the rest of this podcast is explain how I went about uh, breaking free from email and give you some real tactical advice. So some real steps here so you can also break free from your email and hire the right people to help you deal with it. And also I'd like to give you an insight into what my team looks like today in terms of my customer support team. We call them my client care uh, team and how they handle uh, my inbox today and my business today because they really are on the front line of running uh, the entrepreneur's journey business. So first of all, though, let me explain how I did it originally. So we're going back all the way in time over 10 years ago. So I uh, happened to recently graduate from university, and I had some friends who were uh, from university as well. Some of them were graduating from IT and, uh, sorry, information technology degrees. That's what they were graduating from. And one friend of mine in particular, uh, Angela is her name. She uh, is a lovely lady, and she was a friend of mine in university. And she happened to be uh, recently married and about to have her first child. And uh, I thought, you know what, I'll just run run it past her. Maybe she's looking for some stay-at-home work. We can call it an experiment. It was an experiment for me because I wasn't sure whether this was actually even possible and whether I'd be okay with someone handling this role or whether the business could even financially support that person. Uh, and for Angela, too, it was, it was something that sounded appealing because she could continue to work while staying at home, raising her first child. So we, we made an agreement while she was pregnant. In fact, she was about two weeks due And we said, okay, as soon as you have the baby, once you feel you're ready, let me know and we'll get started on uh, this job. And, you know, we basically decided to make it up as we went along. I will be completely honest with you. I had no established systems, no documentation. There was nothing I could hand over to Angela and say, this is how we do things. I was just doing things how I did it. I was basically running on the the seat of my pants, as they say, and and, uh, dynamically responding to whatever came into the inbox. I had some folders, I think, going, but it was pretty straightforward. And, uh, you know, no help desk software, basic email, and that was how the business operated. It was the center point for the business. So Angela had her baby successfully. Uh, I think it was only a week later she said, hey, I'm ready to take over this role. Um, We negotiated a a fairly, uh, I think, uh, low entry uh, hourly rate. Uh, Personally, I didn't know where the business could support someone uh, financially. So I, I need to keep the cost down. And I also felt that you know, this is a fairly casual job too. So it was $15 an hour and this is 12 years ago. So, you know, for virtual assistant work, that was certainly what the going rate was globally. In fact, I could have hired a, a, someone overseas for even 5 to $10 an hour. But Angela, being Australian, uh, obviously requires more money. Uh, and it was an experiment. You know, if Angela wasn't happy with that amount of money, then certainly, you know, she would have told me and I told her to tell me. And we also talked about, you know, raising her rate if things went well over time, which we actually did. So she went up from tw- to $20 and I think even later on $25 an hour. But we started at 15 an hour Australian dollars. And uh, with the kind of plan that it would be about 10 to 20 hours a week, uh, depending on email volume. And that's what we did. So this is how this is when things became really interesting for me, because this is when the real learning and the real um, outsource systems uh, automation kicked in. From my perspective, I basically put a human being into an automation role or into not really an automation role, but certainly she started to build automation into the role, which is also part of my instruction. So this is how we did it. And this is really important because I believe this is still one of the best ways to work with someone who you want to take over your inbox because, let's face it, everyone's inbox is different. Everyone's business is different. It's a fairly dynamic position. So, you know, how you deal with incoming queries, how you close sales, how you uh, provide customer support, how you deal with refunds, and all the different types of emails you've got coming in, that's going to be unique to you. There's no one size fits all. There certainly are some commonalities across the board, and you can get some systems going that uh, deal with those common situations but a lot of what you have to train someone to do and build systems to respond to is custom so it's in my opinion the best way to do this is the following system so 
First of all, obviously hire someone competent. So this is step one. Um, I knew Angela was smart. I knew Angela had strong emotional intelligence. I knew Angela was a good communicator. I didn't know how good she would be at actually writing emails. So there was an aspect of experimenting here in terms of how she interacted with my my customers and my my editors. So there was that that I had to look into. But I knew she was obviously, you know, English was the first language for her. Uh, she had a university degree. So I felt that she was going to do a good job here. But you really have to be careful because if you're hiring someone perhaps where English is their second language, they're coming from, you know, somewhere else in the world, you really want to be sure that you're handing over this very, very important part of your business and your life to someone you trust, someone you believe who will have a good grasp of English, who's responsible. Uh, and, you know, there may be some personal information uh, details coming into your inbox too. Things like password resets can be triggered by your inbox. So you want to make sure they're not suddenly running away with passwords to important things uh, in your life and your business. So as I said, I trusted Angela. What I wasn't sure of was how she'd do. So this is how we started. I said, first of all, Angela, I just want you to read into the archives of sent messages just to see how I reply. So go back in time and look at all the past messages for maybe the last week or two and look at the kind of queries we get, the kind of, kind of emails we get, and then how I reply to them. So just get a feel for what we're dealing with and how I interact, what kind of language and communication I use. That give, gives her a basic uh, framework. I then say to her, once you feel comfortable with that, let me know and then we'll have you start taking over the inbox and actually replying and dealing with some of the emails. Maybe not all of them. It depends how confident you feel. Perhaps you can deal with just, for example, archiving certain emails or pushing certain emails into folders, but leaving the ones you're not sure of for me. So it didn't take long for Angela to feel comfortable enough to do that, maybe a day or two of looking into the history. Then she said, I think I'm ready to start dealing with some of the emails. So I said, go for it. And then from my perspective, I start to monitor her work. So I start to watch what she was doing, how she was replying to messages. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. I, I could check the sent folder in my email account and to see how she was writing, what she was saying. And if I was happy, I would let her know. If I felt there were changes that needed to be done, I would let her know. And this is really, really important. I would also tell her, start looking for things that we do over and over again. If you're finding yourself replying in certain ways uh, or the same ways over and over again or getting the same kind of questions, start looking for places where we can start creating more template replies. So I had a few templates that I used, but really there was a lot of opportunity to create more templates so that we could speed up replying to common questions. Uh, personally, I hadn't done it because I was uh, uh, probably la too lazy or too busy, you know, not not interested in that job, didn't enjoy it. But Angela was there to take on that role, so I knew I could tell her this is important. And it'll make your job better too because you don't have to keep writing the same answers over and over again by hand. You can use those template canned replies as they're often called. So I started to watch Angela, gave her that feedback. She got better and better and better. And then I reached, Then we reached the point where she was almost replying to everything. And of course, you know, within a couple of months, she was replying to every single email. There were always a few things she could not deal with. There were certain things that only I could reply to. They might be addressing me personally, and there were things you know I had to answer. There might be partnerships, things like that. But 95% of the messages she could deal with, whether it was customer response, whether it was dealing with our editing team, whether it was just filing away emails, archiving emails, dealing with spam. So she took over essentially everything, and she started creating systems. She started creating canned responses. She started creating documentation to basically uh, clarify and systematize how we deal with the inbox, which sped up her response time. Now, while she was doing that, I was also carefully watching her hours. So how long was it taking her to get all this done? Obviously, at the start, it takes longer. She has to come up with the canned replies. She has to reply to messages for the first time, and she's more likely to take longer to sort of figure things out, learn how best to respond to things. But once you, you're in, in the trenches for a couple of months, everything should be set up, and, and you can get a good feel Based on email volume, it probably takes her, and I can tell you in our case, it took about two hours a day on average. That's uh, Monday to Friday anyway, uh, maybe a little, little less on weekends. In our business, sometimes even more on weekends because students had uh, you know deadlines on a Monday, so they'd send us work on a weekend. But generally speaking, about two hours on average would be the amount. So we'd 
probably, I, I'm, I'm thinking back now, it's a long time ago, about 10 to 20 hours a week is what Angela ended up doing for the business. And that stayed pretty constant. Obviously, summertime in my business was much quieter. There weren't uh, people writing papers or as many papers in summer because the students are on holidays. But generally speaking, uh, besides a few periods when it's the, the rush period where we probably had a lot more assignments coming in, a lot more work coming in, where she might have to work you know, 30 hours a week, on average, 10 to 20 hours a week. So I could then uh, know my costs and sort of budget. Okay, so Angela is going to cost about $1,000 per month, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on how much work comes in, what time of year it is. But that's the cost to run the customer service. Plus, I could start evaluating how much of an impact she might have on the bottom line as well. Is Angela starting to actually bring in sales? Can I start to instruct her to maybe do a few extra things to uh, bring in new customers like uh, going going back and chasing up people who are submitting thesis because thesis jobs for us were worth a lot of money. So Angela could actually put in a little bit of chasing up work to see if we can close those clients. And if, if a job is worth 500 to to $1,000 for the business, that is worth her spending a few extra, maybe an hour or two over a week to actually do. So that's, that's how Angela got put in place. And then I found myself uh, basically completely out of my business. That was the first time I really tasted the laptop lifestyle because I remember going to travel. In fact, I went over to Canada shortly after Angela came on board and I didn't do anything. I did I, I did not check into the inbox. Uh, Angela contacted me when she needed to. Um, there was a folder in the email system we had with my name on it for emails that only I had, could deal with. Not many messages went in there and it wasn't like they were pressured messages. They were things I could apply to after a week or two. And I, that's what I did. I only went in and checked that folder and actually replied once a week, sometimes even once every two weeks. And that's still how it works today. I only go into my, my Yarrow folder and reply once every week or two. At the moment, it's it's actually almost down to uh, every three weeks to a month because I, I'm basically completely limited myself from from the system in our business, the email system. But back then, uh, the only time I really had to kind of jump on things is when Angela told me, often through like Skype, uh, that's before we had things like Slack, she told me in a Skype message, hey, there's an important uh, question, query, uh, something coming from someone, or we've got an issue with one of our editors wanting to quit, or you know, we need to hire new editors, time to run that process. So besides those few kind of mission critical things or uh, big steps that we do once or twice a year, the everyday day-to-day running of the business was essentially in her hands. And that was fantastic because it gave me a real sense of freedom. And that's what I was after with this business. And that was how we operated for a, a couple of years until I actually sold that business. And when I did sell that business, Angela went with it. So she continued to keep stay in that role with the new owners. I, I can't remember how long she stayed there because once the business was sold, I was no longer you know, really up to date with what things were going on there. I know she eventually uh, left that business, but uh, for a, a part of, well, I, I can tell you honestly, a part of the sales appeal of selling that business was the fact that Angela would come on board because she was able able to help the new owners transition smoothly into taking over the business. So they didn't feel this sense of, I don't know what to do when this happens because they could always ask Angela. So it's a major selling point too if you ever want to sell an online business, if you have someone handling your day-to-day email as well. So that's a factor you might not be considering. Okay, so the first point I want to clarify here in terms of actionable steps is obviously hire someone competent, someone with good English, someone you can trust. That's obvious. Second, is making sure you have some sort of uh, file structure. So Angela and I operated on, under various different file structures over the years. And then even after I left that business, when I got into the entrepreneur's journey business I have now and other businesses I've run over the years, uh, we've had different types of folders. And, I, and nowadays, I actually let my team make up folders as they f- see fit. I will give you some general advice, though. The fewer folders, the better. Obviously, your business is your business and you know what folders you need. In the past, I've had up to even three folders devoted to me. There's been like a, a Yarrow urgent folder with messages that I need to get to within you know one day or two. 
there's been a folder called Yarrow No Reply, which has been for messages like newsletters, things that I need to possibly look at. There's no pressure, there's no time, deadline, no urgency, and there's no need to reply to them, most likely. It's just newsletters, information that I might find interesting. Most of the time, I just go in there and archive most of those emails. And then there's the uh, Yarrow needs to reply to, but no pressure, so no dead, no rush. So there's a rush folder, a don't need to reply to folder and a non-rush but you probably need to reply to folder however uh, I eventually got that down to just a Yarrow folder and that's it and I'll explain a little bit more how that came about over time I recommend for you though obviously start with a folder for you for those messages that only you can deal with but really be serious about getting as few emails as possible into your folder you'd be surprised if you tell your team or your person who's in charge of email that you don't want any emails that will get them into the mindset of how can they deal with messages. And maybe they'll have to ask you the first one or two times how to deal with a certain message, but then they'll figure out a way to deal with it without you. Or they'll come up with a system, a template, a process. Uh, Maybe you don't need to reply to certain messages you think you do. It's actually a great opportunity to ask yourself, do I really need to deal with these emails? Is this that important? And that brings up a point that I really want you to consider when you go through this process yourself is understanding how unimportant most email actually is. There's a strange thing about email. We we have this feeling like we, we have to deal with it. We have to reply. We have to look. We have to go through everything. It, part of it's a fear of missing out. We don't want to miss out the latest information from the people we follow and the newsletters we subscribe to. Uh, we might feel like We want to be in control of everything and know everything going on in our business. So we want to make sure we just have our eye on everything. Um, Maybe we just want the feeling of being the person who actually clears the inbox and getting that sense of an empty inbox, job done, ticked all the boxes. That's an addictive feeling too. So there's all these reasons that keep us uh, trapped and, and answering emails we don't need to answer. So I would suggest to you that you flip the switch and completely change your attitude. It's no longer I want to deal with this, it's I need to remove myself completely. So first of all, let's really be honest and maybe even a little bit um, you know, hard on yourself and, and say, I don't actually need to deal with these emails. I cannot reply to certain people and the world doesn't end. You know, I cannot try and be polite. Uh, One of the craziest things that some people do and a lot of experts over the years have recommended and certain thought leaders, social media stars will tell you to do this because they do it. They say reply to every single query you get, you know, reply to every person who writes to you on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. And even before all social media, it was reply to every email you got because that's how you establish strong connections with people. That's how you build a community. Now, I'm not going to argue with the the merits of doing that. Obviously, if you personally reply to more people, they're going to feel a stronger sense of connection with you. And there's been times where I've uh, attempted to adopt that attitude, but I very quickly realized this is not scalable and it's not really a leveraged activity for me. Yes, it's. I, I agree, it's helpful for building community, but if you want freedom, there are much smarter ways to... Use your time, and most importantly, you can still build a community. You can still have an amazing business without you having a micro-touch on every single aspect of it, and that includes not answering every single email. So I would uh, basically give you the counter-argument to the people who tell you you should reply to everything and say the opposite. You should reply to nothing. (laughs) It, It might feel unrealistic to you right now as you listen to me, but that would be the ethos I want you to walk away from with this podcast. Your job is to get to the point where you do not answer any of your emails. That is true freedom. That is a true system. Obviously, your business still needs to run, but that's your goal. And for that to happen, you're going to have to possibly change your thinking about this idea of responding to everyone personally. What's great today is my team responds to everyone personally. Uh, You know, if there's something they really, really think if I reply, it'll make a difference. Like if I'm the one who leaves a response and it'll save that customer from refunding, uh, then I'll do it. But that has been proven to be something that my team can do over and over again. I'm always surprised how a team member 
putting in a personal response is just as good as you doing it because they they feel cared for the, the customer or the potential customer feels cared for and you know people will realize too that if you're hiring good people you have a good business you know you're a good business owner so it's all a reflection of you so you know in, if anything you should be looking at this as a way to demonstrate that you still care about your community because of the quality of the people you've hired to help support your community so that's the way i would look at that if, if you're feeling a, a a feeling of stress about separating yourself from that kind of role so when you have this new set of glasses, when you're looking at your inbox, you can say, you know what, I don't need to reply to this. I don't need to look at all these newsletters. You know, I unsubscribe to 99% of the newsletters I used to follow. And I realize I don't need to know every single launch going on. I don't need to know every bit of news in my industry or every new technology coming out. Yes, there are times when I will have to try and find information. Maybe I need to find you know, a new system to do something. And that's when it's helpful to learn about platforms, new technology. But you don't need to learn about that every single day. You don't need to pay attention to all those emails. It's better for you to create, not consume. And your inbox is a purely consumption area. Maybe it's, it's an area where you, 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 know, you create because you email back potential customers and that's how you drive your business. But I would argue that's a, a role that can become systematized and done even better without your playing a part in it, you playing a part in it, because your team can start to answer those questions with templates, with longer responses, more tailored responses, things that you just don't have time to do yourself as well. So that's my second tip. So first tip is obviously hire someone competent. Second tip is uh, use folders. Uh, you know, try and get down to only one folder for yourself, even zero folders for yourself if you really want to take things to the next level. Uh, make sure you, uh, you're using some sort of uh, templates, canned responses, and filters. Those are things your team should build. Obviously, you know, you tell them this is something we want to do, uh, but then you say this is your job. Look for ways to build in filtering and templates, canned responses to speed up processes, to, to build systems in place. And also, you can also have them create documentation because at some point, your team member is going to leave your business and you want the next person who comes in to take over and see all these canned responses, these templates, these filters, these folders, and then look at a document and understand how they work. So there's not too much confusion about the transition, uh, you know, to, to doing that. Now, one thing about creating systems uh, for the second point, that's something you can do on the fly. In fact, I think this is really good. If you do like I did with Angela, have the person come into your inbox and first of all, watch. Second of all, start taking over. But once they get to the point of competency and they're actually dealing with your inbox, then they have the space to, to start uh, basically on the fly creating systems. So I would recommend at that point, that's when you say, now's your job to systematize, to create filters, to create structure, and even go a step further. I want you to create processes that can actually do two things, the most important two things for any business, get new customers and retain existing customers. So that is an area where I tell my team all the time, if you can see a way to create a system, a better uh, follow-up process, uh, you know, do a personal phone call, do a Skype call, maybe some kind of live chat, whatever it is, something to enhance this process, maybe, you know, go outside of email, whatever it is, start thinking that way. So, and this is such an important point, your email person, as I said earlier, becomes a customer support person and a salesperson. But not only that, they can become essentially a leader, kind of a leadership role within your company. Give them the power to really excel and show their, their ability to get new customers and uh, retain, stop people from canceling, refunding, and so forth. Uh, we have a team member in our business, Claire, who actually keeps track of all the people that she's either saved from canceling and refunding or people she's convinced, whether it's from a what we call a clarity call, which is a, a Skype call with a potential customer or anything else like a live chat or, you know, an ongoing email discussion, how many people she's brought over the line to become customers, maybe even to upgrade to our, our more expensive uh, flagship program. So that's something you can look for and encourage in your email person as well. Okay, so th those, that's really the key points here. Hire someone competent, build f structures, file folders, templates, documentation. Three, have them move beyond just being responsive to being proactive and trying to get customers and save people. And then you've really got a business that can potentially grow without you simply from the act of hiring someone 
to help with your email. Now, I'll be honest with you, Angela didn't really uh, become a person who you know handled the, the more advanced things I'm talking about there. Uh, she simply didn't have the time. <laughs> uh, after she had one child, she had a second and then a third. So she basically had those 10 to 20 hours she could give me, and that was enough to respond to what we had coming at us. Uh, we had you know many conversations over the years about could she take on more work? Could she start being proactive? Could she be looking for ways to bring in new customers? She just didn't have the time. So after I sold that company and built my new team for my my current blogging business, especially in the last few years as we've expanded the team to have multiple people in the email client care role, we've really been able to go much deeper and do things like that. So my team right now do a lot more in terms of just responding to things in the inbox. Yes, their job is to get the inbox to zero, but they've got a bunch of different folders designed to help them with the follow-up process. Uh, They're very proactive in creating things like clarity calls, getting people onto phone calls to bring them across. So, you know, that's something to really think about with your business. If you're at that point, obviously step one is just to get someone taking over your inbox so you can be at inbox zero. And like I've been, I, I haven't done my email now for, as I said, 12 years. I certainly look at my inbox on a regular basis, usually on my phone, just because I like seeing what's coming in. I have a private email. That's something I should point out. I still keep a personal email for non-business messages. And I've actually really become uh, even more diligent with that in the sense that I'm pulling myself completely out of the business and making it so all I deal with is my private email. I'm trying to completely remove myself from the business email. So that Yarrow folder is almost not, it will barely has any emails at all in it because, you know, I'll be honest with you, over the years, even though I've handed my inbox to other people, those Yarrow folders was still a job, uh, a job I didn't have to do every day. You know, that's great. If you can get away from the point where, you know, you don't have to check your email once a day even. Uh, this is something I remember recently. I was having a dinner conversation with a bunch of entrepreneurs in Vancouver, and I talked about how I, I don't handle my email, and they couldn't even imagine not checking their email in a 24-hour period. That alone was blowing their mind. You mean you don't have to check your email and reply to message once a day? No, I was saying not even once a week. I was going two to three weeks without actually processing my emails. That being said, every two to three weeks, I would have a fairly large pile of emails to deal with. It was often just scanning through newsletters and archiving them, replying to maybe 10, 20 messages. But like I said, that wasn't something I did in a 24-hour period. That was a 7 to 14 to 21-day period. And right now, uh, because of the last few changes I've made to really unsubscribe from the last few newsletters and, and tell the team everything is in your hands, I can honestly say that I, I, I probably only get 5 to 10 emails a month in that folder that I have to personally deal with. And often they're just things like negotiating, uh, you know, certain uh, maybe a podcast interview or, or replying to a podcast interview, which is obviously only something I can do because I have to be on the podcast to do the interview. So, uh, but, you know, things like booking the podcast interviews, other systems are done. You know, I use Calendly to book podcast interviews. So it, it really is something you can completely, almost completely, you know, down to 1% of your messages that you have to personally deal with if you take that on board. Okay, so I think I've given you a pretty good summary. I just want to clarify how things have evolved to where they are today. So I started with just Angela in the customer service role. Then I sold that business. And then with my blogging business, I, I, I've gone through various team members. Uh, and we've had as many as three people manage the inbox, primarily because I want a 24-hour day uh, monitoring of the inbox because we have people coming uh, from around the world who are interested in my products and services, plus the client care team in my business today handles live chat as well. So I'd, I'd like to have people you know, available to do live chats 24-7. At the moment, as I record this, though, we have two people who manage my inbox and do a great job. And uh, it's, it's really completely off my hands. It's folders, it's files. And what I really love about the current team is it's about them taking ownership of that role and seeing it more than just a responsive sort of clearing the inbox job. It's no, no, no. We actually play a crucial part in helping this business not only maintain itself, but even grow. We're, we're the front line. We bring in new customers. 
we can have ideas and test them to bring in new customers or retain customers. And we can even uh, be part of the conversation on, on how this business will grow, what we will do, new, new ideas, and, and how we will actually spend money so they become leaders in the business as well. So you can reach that point if you hire great people. And first of all, though, get the basics done. So I'm going to wrap this uh, solo episode up with a final few steps for you to implement and a bit of a summary. The first thing I want you to do is remember the the steps I've given to you. So first of all, make the decision to step away and remove yourself from the day-to-day aspect of your inbox as a step one. You know, don't have to be 100% out, but make the decision that you're going to hire one person to take over your inbox. Two, hire someone competent. This is a role where you have to trust the person. You can't just grab any random VA and throw them in your inbox straight away because that's risky. You don't know who they are. You don't know what their their skill level is. You're not sure where they're going to run away with passwords. This is a fairly intimate and you know security issue uh, with your business. It's not something you can give to anyone, so you have to trust them. And that that may take time to find the right person. That may take you know. Uh, maybe some face-to-face or Skype-to-Skype kind of conversations to really get a feel. Maybe you have to kind of um, give them small parts of your inbox to deal with at, at first. Sometimes, though, you just have to kind of uh, you know throw in the deep end and, and see how, how they go. I'm also going to mention something at the end of this episode uh, regarding a service that I'm op- offering in a partnership with my team to actually do your email for you. So more about that coming up very soon. Say so two. So once you've got the trustworthy person, uh, and get them doing things on the fly. So have them first of all monitor and watch how you do the job. Then have them take over what they feel comfortable with, leaving some of it for you that they're not ready for, and slowly have them take over everything. Have them then start making template replies, canned responses, documentation on how things work, files, folders, filters. And then once they are completely competent in the reactionary email, tell them to start being proactive. Start looking for ways to improve your business, bring in more sales, or stop people from canceling and refunding, retaining existing customers. Once you reach that point, then you've got a really powerful, uh, proactive team member. And that's what you're ultimately trying to get to. But if as a bare minimum, you can get someone who can take all the email off your hands and give you that freedom, give you that sense of comfort knowing that you don't have to check your inbox every day. That is a huge step forward towards living the laptop lifestyle. So that's the process I recommend you go through. You can take it to multiple team members as I have done if your your business warrants it. You might have so much email coming in that you need three, four, or five people. In fact, they may become you know, a very, very important part of your business because they're, they're essentially salespeople as well. So you know, that, that's something to consider. It might be a key vehicle for growth in your business. But like I said, bare minimum, get someone in there. And I, I honestly believe within a week of that person being in your inbox, they can take away 80% of your email. There's a real 80-20 rule here. They can deal with 80% because 80% of your email is going to be messages that you don't need to deal with because they're really simple. They're new newsletters they're you know things that can be replied to with one sentence like no thanks you know all these little things like that they can deal with they can learn very quickly the remaining 20% might take longer but you know how would you feel right now if 80% of your email was no longer your job i'm pretty sure you'd be happy with that and that could happen within the next week that's a realistic outcome for you in the next week and that leads me to a great time to segue into some exciting news so I have uh, got a new, uh, basically a new business, uh, which is going into a beta launch period. So uh, that's as I record this. In fact, when you're listening to this, it may be out of beta and fully uh, be available to the public. However, as I record this, we're only looking for our first few beta trial people uh, for a new service. And it's got a great name. It's called InboxDone.com. Inbox Done which essentially means your email inbox done for you. So if you like everything I've talked about in this podcast, I'm partnering with my client care team to essentially offer the same level of service that my team does for me to a select handful of other 
entrepreneurs, other online entrepreneurs. So if you'd like my team member, one of them, to basically take over email for your business and do everything I talked about in this podcast, do do all the canned replies, the templates, learn about your business, and, and go in there every day and actually reply to your message, start setting up systems, and potentially even become a person who brings in more sales because they learn how to deal with those client queries to chase up potential customers, do the things that maybe you don't have time to do or you know you want to do, but you just haven't found you know the way to do it. You're not sure on the best kind of follow-up process. My team have done it for me so they can do it for you. However, because I only have a small team, we don't have capacity for many people. So this is going to be a really boutique service for a handful of other online entrepreneurs who are looking for someone to you know, really be a partner and a team member to step into your business and take over this inbox, this email role, learn how your business works, and become a, a fairly regular part of your team. You know, This is a, uh, an ongoing role. They, they become an intimate member, uh, and they have an intimate understanding of your business. So that's important. So if you're looking for someone like that, someone you can trust because I trust them, then inboxdone.com is the website address to go check out. Depending on when you listen to this, you might find an early notice or a coming soon or you just missed out, but there'll be another chance to sign up notice on that page where you can enter your email address and we'll let you know as soon as the door is open. But like I said, this is a boutique service because it's so personalized, so tailored. You know, We're not looking to do uh, a really, really low-priced, shoddy job for a lot of people. We're looking to, uh, looking to offer a higher-priced but premium-quality service for a handful of entrepreneurs who really understand the value of this kind of person and who want to break free from email forever. That's ultimately the goal here. So you never have to deal with the email in your business ever again. And you feel confident that someone responsible and trustworthy is dealing with it and even someone there who could potentially grow your business. So inboxdone.com is the place to go if you're interested. And uh, if you are one of the lucky people who applies and gets accepted, I can't wait to start working with you on this this new business we're launching. So that's inboxdone.com. Okay, I'm going to call that done for this special EJ podcast solo edition talking about how to get your inbox empty. So how to get down to inbox zero and get to the point where you can never deal with email again, just as I have not had to do. I've not dealt with my email personally now in over a decade. And as I said earlier, I believe it is the single best thing I've ever done to live the laptop lifestyle. So I hope you take away some of the ideas I've talked about in this episode and apply them to your business. If you do manage to break away from email and something I said today helped you do so, I would love to hear about that. So please hit me up on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or send us an email and let me know how your life and your business changed because of this podcast. And if you apply to inboxdone.com, I can't wait to hear more about what your business is about. All right, I'm going to call that the end. This has been the EJ Podcast. You can find all the other episodes, including other solo episodes like this one featuring just me, as well as a huge back catalog of amazing interviews with uh, entrepreneurs like Tim Ferriss, the founder of, of a Weber. Uh, there's Steve Baxter, one of the sharks from Shark Tank in Australia. There's all kinds of amazing interviews from, from people who are doing online business. There's a lot of bloggers in there all within the EJ Podcast archives. That's ejpodcast.com if you want to catch those. And if you want to find the show notes and all the details and links to go along with this episode, you can go to ejpodcast.com forward slash the number five. This is the fifth episode of the EJ Podcast solo editions. Okay, that's it from me. My name is Yarrow. Thanks again for listening and I'll talk to you on a future episode of the EJ Podcast. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the EJ Podcast. If you're interested in following in the footsteps of myself and many other successful people who use blogs to grow a business, then I invite you to download a free copy of my Blog Profits Blueprint Report, which has been downloaded over 150,000 times and is the starting point for many very successful bloggers today. It's an A to Z guide on how to choose a topic, market your blog, set all the technology up, and of course, make money from blogging as well. 
100% free in audio and written text. You can get it from blogprofitsblueprint.com. Just enter your email address there and I'll send you a free download for the Blog Profits Blueprint. Thanks again for listening.